Hola, hola a todos. Espero que estén bien. Estamos con una nueva entrevista de estas que son para sentarse y escuchar. Y a estas debería agregarles, aparte de sentarse y escuchar, tengan paciencia. Son las entrevistas hechas en inglés que tienen que esperar a que los subtítulos carguen. Después van abajo a configuración, ponen subtítulos, van a configuración, buscan que los subtítulos estén en español y ahí van a poder verla. Y les digo que se tomen todo este trabajo porque de verdad vale la pena ver esta próxima entrevista. Que es con un personaje que es muy conocido, que yo lo he conocido hace ya muchos años. Y que hoy ante este nuevo contexto, esta nueva realidad mundial, creo que su nombre empieza a cobrar mucha más fuerza. Él se llama Ken Johnston. Es un ex trabajador de la NASA, trabo, trabajó en los programas espaciales, trabajó en análisis de imágenes y él se termina yendo de la NASA hablando de muchas imágenes que empezaban a aparecer y no quiero spoilear ni adelantar nada, así que escuchen a Ken Johnston. Esta es una entrevista que vale la pena escuchar completa. Es una persona que trabajó en uno de los puntos neurálgicos de la investigación espacial en nuestro planeta y tiene declaraciones que a poca gente le van a escuchar. Let's start with your name, completing com that. How do you like uh, to appear, in, you know, on the, the screen, in the back? Uh, uh, Dr. Ken Johnston. Dr. Ken Johnston. Yes. Okay. I worked very hard to get that. <laughs> Absolutely, I know that. Mm -hmm. So, well, you can start with, uh, with, with talking about uh, your, your, okay. your bio. Sure, we ready to start? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was born in a little town in Texas uh, called Hart, Texas, and uh, there were about 560 people there, so we were expected to grow up and become farmers. But my father had been a, a pilot in World War II, and uh, he had given his life in fighting World War II, and I always wanted to grow up and become a pilot like him. So when I got to be in um, high school, I went off to the Oklahoma Military Academy, graduated from there, and in junior college, uh, joined the Marine Corps, United States Marine Corps after that. and. Um, went off uh, to Pensacola and became a, a pilot. Uh, after I got out of the Marine Corps, I wound up uh, going down to Houston, Texas, where the Johnson Spacecraft Center was, and I was hired by uh, the Grumman Aerospace Company at the time. Now it's Lockheed Grumman, but back then it was Grumman. And uh, they hired me to be one of their first four civilian astronaut consultant pilots. My job was um, at the factory to learn everything about the lunar module all 486 different switches and circuit breakers and instruments and gauges and understand how they all work so that when, uh, when one of the regular astronauts would come into the, the test vehicle, which we called LTA-8, it's a lunar module test article number eight, uh, and he had questions, it was up to one of us four um, civilian astronauts to answer the questions and teach them how to fly it. Ultimately, they were able to fly to the moon, land on the moon safely and come back to the Earth. After that, I went to work um, Uh, for the uh, Boeing company as a 737 flight instructor and I retired from Boeing in 1998 and uh, since then we moved to, Houston, uh, to Albuquerque, New Mexico where my wife and I raise little miniature horses and uh, we look out for 18, 18 grandchildren and two great-grandchildren so that kind of brings me up to, up to current. Now as far as um, while I was at NASA and the Apollo program uh, I After the being a consultant pilot, I went over to the Lunar Receiving Laboratory, and it's where I was given the position as the director of the data and photo control department, and my job was to keep track of all of the films and pictures and things that were, that were taken on the moon of the lunar samples and, and from orbit so that uh, scientists around the world could look at their samples that they got from the moon and uh, know exactly where it was oriented. Was it upside down, north, south, east, west? All that information. I kept... Um, Uh, track of all of those things. So that's kind of what led me to the position to be uh, at, at the right place to uh, see a few things that were going on that maybe not everybody was supposed to see. Great. So, no. so with that, I didn't want to, with that I didn't want to get into to everything that we're going to be talking about that stuff later. Yeah, so just sort of. You have a third last job in the photography department of NASA. Mm -hmm. George asked me to expand a little explain, more. Explain, yeah. Okay. With specific. Areas. Sure. Are you ready? Yeah. All right, when I was working at the uh, Lunar Receiving Laboratory, I was given the position as the uh, director of the Data and Photo Control Department. We were, my job was um, after the photo uh, department processed the film coming back from the, uh, the, the lunar missions, my job was to take them. And I kept five copies 
of every single picture and film strip that was made during each one of the Apollo missions. And uh, there came a time uh, right after Apollo 15 where the direction came down from NASA headquarters that said they wanted to destroy all but one copy. And uh, since I knew this had all been paid for by the American taxpayers, I asked, well, can I donate uh, sets to uh, some of the colleges to their science departments because I know they'd really like to have these. I mean, it's very valuable. And I was told, no, just throw them in the trash, get rid of them, uh, do whatever you do, just get rid of them. So I took that as um, sort of permission to go ahead and keep one set for myself. So I, I had to maintain the, the master set, and then the other set I put into a duffel bag and, and I took it home with me and kept it for five years uh, just in my closet. And um, at a point in 1995, when uh, there was a lot of controversy going on about did we really go to the moon or not, what did we see on the moon, uh, I ran into a gentleman by the name of Richard Hoagland, and I told him that what I had, and they immediately um, put me on a plane, sent me to Oklahoma City, where the university is, that I um, uh, had donated the film and pictures to, and uh, I was able to pick them up and bring them back, and we used those. Now, the pictures I had were made, they were the first generation, so you know that if you're looking at a copy of a copy of a copy, pretty soon it gets blurry. And uh, mine were originals right from the very original negatives. So the, the pictures in my collection, my set, were very, very um, important because you could see details and things that you wouldn't ordinarily be able to see on some of the copies. If you ordered them from NASA today, you wouldn't even hardly see anything. It would be very blurry. So, uh, what, what, what did you see in, in the pictures? Okay. Could you explain? The, the other part of my duties there at the Data and Photo Control Department is I was the um, editor and uh, producer of the Lunar Sample Information Catalogs, which means I had a staff of secretaries that, that typed up the information when we'd have the scientists would be studying the moon rocks to see what they were made of, and then we'd put it together and I'd, I'd add the pictures to them uh, to create a, a, um, a book for each one of the lunar missions. And those were called, the, for instance, the Apollo 12 Lunar Sample Information Catalog and Apollo 14, Apollo 15, 16, and 17. Now, Later on, uh, whenever we, I re retrieved my set and I was working with uh, Mr. Hoagland in the Enterprise Mission, the name of his, his organization is EnterpriseMission.com, and um, some of the things that scientists and, and geologists would look at, they would see uh, things that didn't look like they would be considered natural formations, where you have 90 degree angles and steps up, coming up step type pyramids. There are columns. Uh, quite a few of them around on the moon that look like giant towers that are sticking up from the lunar surface. And uh, I have a lot of pictures of those. Some of those are actually standing as high as five miles above the lunar surface. And you have to understand with, with no environment, no wind, no air, uh, there's nothing to cause them to bend or to fall over. So they could be, be build towers as high as they want. And some of the other items we would see was where at one time there would probably have been a dome uh, so that there was a living environment inside of it that over the years, hundreds or even thousands of years, those had decayed and collapsed. And I have several pictures of those where you can actually see that it was a dome and you can see where it, half of it is cracked and falling. In fact, the Russians, um, the Russians made a very good photograph uh, of the moon and right on the, the lib, right on the, the curvature of the lunar surface, there's a dome sitting right on the edge with it's cracked and fallen in. Some really fascinating pictures. And then on the back side of the moon, um, I'm going to cut right here a second because I want to ask you a question. Okay. Um, do you want me to go ahead and get into right now where uh, I had the scientists want me to show the films and the pictures and things and what we saw on the back side of the moon and stuff like that? Or do you want to save that for another question? No, no, you, you can go ahead and uh, they, they do uh, you know, that. I know how it works. The, the face, you know. Little green men in mirrors will cut and splice. Okay. Uh, all right. And on, uh, right after the Apollo 14 mission, the, uh, Dr. Thornton Page, Dr. Thornton Page was uh, the director of the Lunar uh, Science and Planetary and Science Department of NASA. Uh, he contacted me because being in charge of the Data and Photo Control Department and also the fact that while I was in the Marine Corps, I had learned to run a 16 millimeter gun sequence camera. And then those of you who are in the military that know how uh, quite often you'll see pictures that come back that where the airplane is flying and you see it, they're actually filming where they're shooting and where things land. Well, that's called a gun sequence camera. And in the projector with that, oh, oh cut, it's my fault. Is your fault. My fault, oh, okay. my fault. I will, I will turn this thing off and it, I'm gonna turn it completely off, standby. It happens. 
Better to get it done now. It's over. Yeah. So we can I'll pick up. The... I'll pick up with the gun sequence camera. Yeah, Huh? No, he, he, he catch some interference. Okay. okay. Ready? Okay. So with the gun sequence camera, you can zoom in, you can draw back out, you can uh, go in two frames at a time, or three or four, or et cetera. Well, uh, Dr. Page had me check out from the, the main photo lab the, the, a specific reel of 16 millimeter film that was being, that was, was filmed during the Apollo 14 mission. While the astronauts were on the lunar surface, the command module going around and around the moon was filming, making pictures, part of uh, mapping the surface of the moon. Well, I checked that film out and I took it uh, over to one of the buildings next to Mission Control where Dr. Page and seven other of the uh, um, astronomers and scientists met me in this one room. We set it up and I, I was showing the pictures and we're looking at the surface of the moon as, it, as the spacecraft's coming over the top. And we're approaching a medium-sized crater on the back side of the moon uh, and as I recall, the name of the crater is called Tsiolkovsky. It starts with a T, Tsiolkovsky, the very famous Russian scientist. It, they, they named the most, Russians named most of the craters on the backside of the moon, by the way. At any rate, so as we're approaching this crater with the sun angle such that half of the crater was in shadow, and as the, the uh, spacecraft is coming over and looking down into the crater, right in the bottom of the shadow area, there was a cluster of five glowing domes. And there was one of them where they looked like a streak of, of steam or something was coming out from them. Dr. Page had me stop, freeze the camera, zoom in close so they could see, back, back out, back up, go forward two or three times. And then he turned to the other seven uh, scientists there with him and says, well, boys, what do you think about that? And they all laughed like it was an inside joke that they knew what was on the backside. And the reason Dr. Page had me check out that specific reel is because he had heard that they had, the, from the astronauts, that they had seen that and that he wanted to show it to just, that, just the inside people and uh, so I showed the film and uh, he says, go ahead and finish. So I finished up that reel and I, I had to check it back into the uh, main photo lab. And now you have to understand in the photo lab because at the time everything was classified. You had to have a secret clearance to go into the back half where th things are stored. And I had a top secret clearance at the time. So I take the film and I go through the inner, uh, inner doors into the, the this central area uh, behind the, the secure doors and I found there's a group of three people sitting there. Uh, there were two men and one, one female sitting at a light table about oh, three and a half feet by three and a half feet with light shining up from bottom. It, it was so that they could uh, put in, enlargement negatives over the top and then what they were sitting there was doing and they were painting out features and things that were on the lunar surface and on the, on the horizon and I, it looked strange to me so I, asked, I said, well, what are you guys doing? And uh, one of the guys says, oh, we're professional strippers. And the lady says, no, I think she took a little offense at that. She said, what we're doing is we are stripping out, and that's a, their term of painting over things. And she says, we're painting out the stars and things on the horizon because we don't want people to get, be confused with the lights about what they're seeing. I said, oh, okay. Well, I, so I checked the film in, and I left. Now, um, the next day, I was asked to check the same reel out take it to the main auditorium at NASA, the Johnson Space Center, and show it for all the rank and file regular scientists and regular engineers and people there at, on the NASA campus. And um, my brother was there, my cousin and a few good close friends, and they're sitting around me while I'm running the camera. And um, the projector, I told him, you won't believe what we found on the back side of the moon. Watch this. And so we're approaching uh, Crater Tsiolkovsky, and there's the shadow, and there's nothing in the shadow. And I look at it, and, and I stop the camera, and I told everyone in the audience, I said, I was having a little technical difficulties, and I, I took the film out and examined it, and there was no place where they get cut or spliced. So what had happened, within 24 hours, they had taken the original, taken it out, and, and uh, either copied it and then painted over what they want to paint over, put it back, and then made a duplicate reel, and that's what I showed. So that after, I had to take, once I finished, I put it back in and finished the, uh, the show for the rest of the uh, people. And I uh, took the roll back to the photo lab to turn it in, and that afternoon over at the Lunar Receiving Laboratory, I ran into Dr. Page, and I asked Dr. Page, I said, you know, what happened to those, those lights and those domes we saw on the back side of the moon? He looked at me, and he gave me a wink, and he says, there was never anything there. Now, Dr. Page, you have to understand, Dr. Page wore a patch over one eye. He, he actually was blind in one eye, but whenever he looks at you, you know, you want a patch, maybe when he goes like this, 
there was never anything there. You'd know he's winking at you. So those types of things would happen occasionally. And um, it, it always, you know, we, we were all so busy trying to get to the moon, get back within the time President Kennedy said we needed to do it, and then go to the next mission and the next mission, that we, we would see something and say, well, you know, I'm going to look into that when I have time. But when you're working six and seven days a week, um, 10 and 12 hours a day, you don't have much time to do any research. And then all of a sudden we all get laid off. So now we're in, not in a place to do any checking in those. So fortunately, having the collection of, of photographs and pictures and things I have, we've been able to use those as a, a master set. So whenever someone says, you know, I saw something on this picture, it was uh, AS 14 dash, you know, 1592. And that would mean that it was on Apollo 15 and frame 1590. And I don't know if that's anything specific, but we would take their picture and we'd take and go to my files and pull up my picture and do a comparison and, uh, and see if what they're saying there looked like there was a, a pyramid or a dome or a tower and look at the original pictures and say, no, you're just looking at scratches on the, on the copy or, or, yep, you're right, there is something there, especially some arches and bridges and things that we've seen. So. Tom, is there any chance to get confused between a natural structure and a technological structure because some people say no these people are it's a mm. lunatic no they mm. see a structure where it's, it's a something natural mm. uh, well the geology on the moon is a little bit different because you don't have the water and you don't have the wind erosion that you have but geology is is geology and nature pretty much duplicates itself and you geologists uh, professionals can look at something and see if it is a natural type occurring phenomenon either the way that uh, rocks or meteors and things might shatter or break. And um, if they look at something and they say, that, you know, I've never seen anything like this uh, occurring naturally, then you have to look, step back and say, well, then, then it must not be a natural thing. It must be something that was um, created by uh, intelligent beings. Yes. Uh, well, let's start with the okay. Okay. Give a break. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so chapter one is uh, it's about the, the close encounters. Uh, the first question is, what do you think about the close encounters? Could could be uh, the human the humanity coming from the future, maybe or okay. What's your okay. Okay. Um, as far as um, ET contact, and that, that uh, I've read a lot about, of course, and, and I'm sure nearly everyone else has, and the question comes out, well, could it possibly be perhaps ourselves in the future coming back? Well, if you look at uh, some of the ancient histories and some of the um, texts from the ancient Sumerian clay tablets that uh, Dr. Um, uh, Zachariah Sitchin had done the translations on, and you're looking at uh, perhaps the, uh, the Anunnaki, which uh, are mentioned in the Bible, that uh, every 3,600 years when their planet, uh, Nabiru, comes back into our inner, inner part of our solar system, you'd have to say to yourself, okay, why would they have to wait 3,600 years if they were able to come from the future and, and go back and forth in time? So my answer would be, no, they're not coming from the future or from the past. That these, these are real-time occurring events. And, um, and as a matter of fact, uh, they're becoming much more common, particularly in uh, South America and some of the other countries, you you see a, a lot more uh, uh, alien craft and uh, flying saucers. If you want to use UFO, I like that better because it is an unidentified flying object. So, I the answer I have is no. It's not from the future. It it has to be uh, in the present. Okay. What do you think about the relevance that um, all the reports are for uh, for a ufology, uh, ufology? No, okay. Okay. Yeah. What kind of relevance? Relevance. Do these reports of alien beings have for the ufology? No? And we're talking about contact yes. and, and the relevance of it. Um, I'm I'm personally d can't quite get a grip on why, um, other than the fact that there was an agreement made, and I, I truly believe the agreement was made with uh, President uh, Ike Eisenhower between the ET and. Uh, our country, that uh, he was not willing to have it come public at that time. So in the meantime, you're going to have individual contacts and some close encounters 
And for that reason, it does have some relevance about what's going on. I mean, you've got to get from point A to point B, and so uh, their craft may be able to cloak and become invisible or, or come in, and particularly whenever they're, they're coming in from outside of our atmosphere and they suddenly appear. Um, the fact that uh, they are intelligent beings and they can move pretty freely about, <laughs> we can't do much about it, not with our, our level of technology. Do you think that phenomena represent a danger for us in, in a way? Well, you, a lot of people fear. In fact, um, one of the gentlemen that used to be a very good friend of mine back when I was at NASA, and um, his name is uh, James Oberg, Mr. James Oberg. He, was, he has his master's degree in uh, mass media indoctrination. And we would sit for hours and talk about, um, for instance, back in the late 50s, you had the science fiction movies called The Blob, and just about everything that would come along was, was, was fearful, and everyone would be afraid of what it was until we got to the age of uh, Star Trek and where we would go throughout the universe and discover um, intelligent beings. So, um, cut. What was the rest of the question there? Wanting to, what is relevance? Uh, yeah, well, it's the, the question is what the relevance for the ufology. Maybe. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I have that. Well, you need to check the forum. Don't, don't worry. Uh, there are a lot, of, a lot of stuff here. <laughs> but, um, I wanted to get it in the same context and pick up where I left off. Well, in the next question, you talk about uh, what's the position of uh, um, the government, no? Uh, uh, yep. this and that was part of it, too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, we'll go back now. Yeah. Okay, so since the government didn't really want us uh, to, to know that we're making direct contact with them, uh, there was a, a report issued in December 14, 1960, by the um, university uh, think tank, it was called the Brookings Institute. Now the Brookings Institute, and you can go on uh, the internet, look up Brookings Institute um, uh, information they provided to the president in 1960, in which they did a study about what would be the effect if uh, it was made public that we had discovered extraterrestrials or the existence of, of intelligent life, either past or present. And they went on to say that the most likely locations where we would find this would be either on, uh, on Mars or on the, on the Earth and or on the Moon. And as I mentioned earlier, we've certainly seen a lot of evidence that there has been intelligent life uh, at various periods of time on the lunar surface. And now we're looking at a lot of pictures of things on Mars. So um, the relevance is that, you know, they, they weren't able to, the Brookings says if you let that become public, People are going to panic because they know that the military can't do anything about them, and people have a tendency to fear the unknown. So uh, now we've had 40, 50 years since Roswell, and people are getting more custom. Back in the day when I was talking with um, Oberg, and he was talking about now we've become so accustomed to it. Even religions come out and say, in fact, the Pope just recently said that uh, there was evidence that there, there probably is intelligent life elsewhere in the universe. So um, having that said, and I'll find some place, cut that out. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to think how to word this. Okay, so o Oberg, uh, the way he explained it, said, what if the a UFO were to land in Washington, D.C. on the White House lawn and uh, this big blue furry creature came out and the little kid says, look, Mom, there's, there's the cookie monster. He's my friend. So the whole population of the Earth has come to the point where they are in a position, they're ready for, uh, to, to they, what's the word they're looking for? Um, that uh, Dr. Greer uses all the time about, uh, not exposure, but then coming forward. Um, Regarding the, the mass disclosure. Oh, yeah. disclosure. Okay, go back. So, so what the, he says, we're now ready for full disclosure. And that's what I'm, I've, we've been expecting for the past two or three years uh, since just before uh, Obama took office that they were ready to come forward and make it public. Instead, they did declassify uh, a lot of the files, and they were, they were called um, uh, de de well, the classified information. And now those are coming. Only problem is, is they have blacked out so much information on them uh, under the uh, guise of it's uh, to protect national security. But there's enough information when you correlate those with other events that you know that these were definitely uh, either ET contacts or they were UFOs sighted for real, particularly in other countries. Okay, let's go back to the moon. All right. What's the interesting question is, 
Where did they find? Uh, you talked before, but let's go to a general uh, okay. uh, assessment. Okay. Now, th the moon, interesting enough, if, if in fact human beings are the result of um, uh, alien contact and manipulation or changing of our DNA that helped produce uh, for us to advance and become much more intelligent, I if in fact they did do this, and you, if you were doing this and you wanted to observe your, your experiment, if we were ex an experiment, you'd want to be able to look at them uh, from uh, a very good location. Well, on the moon, there is a crater that is located almost, almost bullseye center of the moon. In other words, so the best place to look at the Earth would be right from the middle of the moon because it's going to stay facing the Earth because it's in locked synchronous orbit. Um, so there, at this crater, and um, I'll give you some pictures of it so that you can see it. If you look at the crater up close, you can see that there are what we call buttresses in three different places and then other three supports. And it appears that at one time there had been a dome over the top of this crater. And so and now we're talking about perhaps hundreds of thousands of years ago, at least more than 100,000 years ago. And the dome has since, of course, gone. Now, other features we have seen there, there, I have some pictures which look like tracks of a vehicle that have come down a valley. Um, I've had people now say, no, that was a boulder that just rolled down the side of the mountain. And my answer was, well, okay, this boulder that rolled down the side of the mountain, how come it split off and two of them went in two different directions? So I have the pictures for that. There are some fascinating pictures of uh, look like there are uh, habitats uh, in step pyramid type structures with walls around them. There are places where there are roads that actually go underneath bridges. Um, these things are, are visible in, in the, the pictures that I have. Do we have some copies in the, in the file? Huh? Yes. Yeah. Let me throw some more in there. There's um. On, on the front side of the moon, there's a, uh, an area which has been dubbed uh, Los Angeles because um, Carl Sagan once said that if you were looking to see if there was any evidence of uh, intelligent life on a planet, and you would look for uh, the type of, uh, like when you're looking from the Earth, from uh, outer space looking at the Earth, and you see lines and things look like where there were roads perhaps and structures, but you couldn't make out much, but at least you can see these, these, uh, the type of striations there. Well, uh, that area on the moon is just laced with, with like it was a, an ancient city at one time. But the main thing is suspended in the atmosphere, not that, uh, up above the lunar surface as high as five miles, there's this structure we call the castle, and it is actually being supported by a glass supporting rod. And uh, so that thing is, 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 is just hanging there in mid space. And another one on Apollo 15. Uh, there's a giant beam leaning up against the side of a mountain, then it actually sags and curves where it's leaning up against the mountain. And those things are just not natural events. But one of the interesting things is on the moon, silicone is very prevalent in almost all of the material. And of course, silicone, and you make glass. Well, glass in a vacuum has the tensile strength of steel. I mean, it will shatter, but it's got the strength. And uh, so we've even talked about if we were to build structures and things, we would make them out of glass. And if you take glass over a oh, thousand years or more, 100,000 years, where little micrometeorites have been pinpointing and, and zapping it, pretty soon it becomes very, very, cr it would almost crumble like uh, the ash of a cigarette. Just touch it and it would, it would crumble. So we, I have some pictures that show some evidence of that as well. Amazing. Okay, our next question is, um, how is it possible that on site space relationship and other organization related to it can keep such uh, strict silence. Uh -huh. uh, you put something here. So yes. Let's see if I got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, when people such as myself have come across evidence of um, the existence of other intelligent life, uh, people ask, well, you know, how come a government, they say, no, it is that governments couldn't keep that kind of secrets. Well, I can give you a perfect example of one particular individual. There's a, an airman, and I won't disclose his name because he's still in the Air Force. Uh, he uh, and it had come to me as a minister to perform a wedding for me, and we were talking about UFOs and things. And I said, oh, well, I'll bring in my book that shows you uh, where a UFO crashed over in, in Africa and uh, what we did. And he kind of looked strange. The next day I brought in my book, and I 
flipped over and showed him where the Air Force has a complete instruction of how they will go to another country where they'll go where a there had been a crash or a landing and that they would gather up any evidence that there was. His reaction, he, he was just actually in nervous <coughs> shaking. He says, I can't believe this. He says, I've had a gun held to my head. He said that if I disclosed any of the information, he was on the team that went over in East Africa and did recover a downed UFO. And he's telling me, this, and he says, and you're showing me that it's in print and people have been able to look and read this. He says, I, I can't deal with that because I was told my family uh, would be killed or they would take me out into the desert and they would no one would ever find me. So uh, fear and is a very strong motivator to keep your mouth shut. Okay. Uh, why do astronauts and employees of space agencies are privileged witnesses of the UFO phenomenon? And, and so the, I couldn't quite understand the question. Is it you want to know why are astronauts? Uh, well, I, I I will change the question. Okay. It's who is it the who have more uh, power to discriminate that the whether the UFO are or or some uh, technological. Uh, what? So how come well, the astronauts would be privileged to that because they're the ones that are going to be in space now they're in the uh, International Space Station. And uh, they've made a, a lot of photographs and, and uh, videos of um, uh, what would appear to be vehicles coming up through the atmosphere and streaking off out into outer space. And, you know, a lot of these they try to explain away as lightning. And, uh, of course, back in the older days, they would say it was swamp gas. It wasn't a UFO that landed. It was swamp gas or a bubble, ball lightning. But the astronauts themselves, um, and there's an interesting theory, or it could be factual, and this is back in the early days of the Apollo program. Uh, the question came up, how come the astronauts haven't come forward and told the things that they saw? And a, a perfect example is on uh, Apollo 11, while they were in translunar coast, that's coasting between the Earth and the Moon, uh, astronaut um, Buzz Aldrin uh, had noticed an object looked like it was keeping track, uh, pace with the spacecraft going to, to the Moon. So he called um, Capcom Communications and asked, uh, where is the um, uh, Stage 2, the um, uh, Saturn 2 rocket that put them in the translunar coast? And they came back, oh, it's several hundred miles off at this angle. He said, okay, we just, we just want to know if that was what we were looking at. And when in reality it wasn't because it, they, they would not have been able to see that small rocket uh, several hundred miles away. And this kept pace. One of the other things that has happened, and I was on, uh, worked for the, um, the company that we built the Peacekeeper missile. The, uh, and um, every time we'd get ready to make a launch, we would send out communications to the Russians, everyone, and their, their craft that were out off the west coast from Vandenberg Air Force Base. And when we would launch, the, we would have radar tracking, and, and nearly every launch and things, we would find there would be a craft that would come in and follow uh, our, our missiles as they would go up to be sure they stayed on track. So we've had UFOs tracking our not only our aircraft, but our rockets, our astronauts. And the uh, key thing on what they, they saw or couldn't talk about, when they get back to the Earth, they go through a uh, debriefing, just like uh, any, any military mission would be. The woman psychiatrist that was in charge of doing the debriefing, uh, her expertise were in brainwashing. That's what her specialty was. And uh, if you know what brainwashing is, there was a movie called the um, um, Nigerian, n n not Nigerian, let's cut this out, but uh, candidate, Man Manchurian candidate. They, um, it was called the Manchurian candidate. Well, the theory is that uh, she would have to brainwash our astronauts coming back during the debriefing so they would not remember certain things that they saw. And it's real interesting when the astronauts would be sitting around and being uh, asked questions by press about, well, what did it feel like? You know, what did, you know, when you were on the surface, uh, and they would always kind of pause. Well, you know, I don't really know. We were so busy. And it was like part of their memory was missing there. Now, but again, that's a theory. Uh, you might a question here. You put a beside grouping. Uh, with what, what kind of procedure uh, the agencies follow after a, a UFO report? And you, you, you mark something at Brookings. Yeah, yeah. Brookings. Huh? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Well, and after, you know, you, you have your sightings and things that take place all many places around the world, and people are a little easier to come forward now, but in the earlier days, back in the, the mid-60s and 70s, um, 
when the governments would get a hold of information, they would stick with the directive from the Brookings Institute report that I mentioned earlier. And in that report, it, it, it said, do not make it public because uh, you would lose control. You'd lose the power over the people. Are there official agencies useful in the UFO investigation? You, you must know. Yeah, the, the read the question again. Yeah. Uh, uh, are there official agencies useful? Oh, okay. Okay, the, the, as far as uh, agencies are concerned that have been formed, you had Project Blue Book, you had uh, SETI is still going on. And uh, people say, well, you know, what value have those uh, agencies been? Well, um, the government will start a project and then come out public and say, well, there was nothing to it, and they end the project. But in reality, they change the name. They keep the study and, and the research and things going on. So uh, it publicly, you know, well, there must not have been anything to it because they shut down the program. Not true. In fact, that they uh, were created, uh, I will acknowledge uh, that the U.S. has an input here. Why? Uh, Okay, I'm using that letter. Yeah. Um, okay. Now, when people ask, you know, why um, why would they be afraid of um, uh, perhaps a war, uh, Star Wars, and uh, aliens coming to attack us, if you were to look at it from an intelligence point of view, look at it from the standpoint of saying, if they are that interested in us as a species and uh, as our our planet because of the water and the resources we have, why would they come and destroy that? I mean, that's completely op opposite or opposed to what you, you would expect an intelligent uh, entity, sentient beings, would do. It would make no sense for them to want to come and destroy us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 